Hi guys, Olive here. Here today to review Matrix by Lauren Groff. This book was published in 2021 by Riverhead Books, which is an imprint of Penguin. The hardcover of this book comes in at 272 pages. However, I read an e-copy that I received for free for reviewing purposes through NetGalley. This is Lauren Groff's fourth novel. She is also the author of two short story collections, but I would say what she's most known for is the last novel that she released in 2015 called Fates and Furies. Her two previous books before she released Fates and Furies had been relatively well received, but Fates and Furies is really the book that put her on the map in the literary world. It was a finalist for the National Book Award. Even former President Barack Obama called it his favorite book of 2015. Up until this point, Lauren Groff hadn't released another novel since Fates and Furies was released back in 2015. The last book she put out was actually the second of her two short story collections. So people have been highly anticipating a new novel from her. And I am a part of that club because I loved Fates and Furies back in 2015. I know that book was at the time and likely still is very divisive, very Marmite, if you will. Some people love it, other people absolutely hate it. And I'm choosing to underline that fact at the start of this video because I am expecting very similar reactions to this new novel from her. <laughs> Matrix is, or at least it's being advertised as, the story of Marie de France, a poet who is believed to have lived in late 12th century England. Very little is known about her life or her identity. Some people think that she was an abbess. One theory supposes that she may have been related to the royal family, but it is clear that she was someone who was educated, someone who had a certain amount of status within society, but we still don't know 100% who she was. It's not even crystal clear if her name was actually Marie or if she was using a pen name. But here's where I feel like I need to make another early interjection and do something I too frequently need to do in my reviews. I need to give in between you and the publisher's marketing of this book, because that synopsis that they slapped on the back of this book, I feel completely mischaracterizes it. And I think it's setting readers up to be disappointed because it's making promises that Lauren Groff never made and never sought to keep. What I can tell you about this book is that it is indeed about a woman named Marie. She is the illegitimate half-sister of Queen Eleanor of Aquitaine. She lives at court after the death of her mother and up until age 17, when it's decided that she won't be able to be married off because of her physical appearance. So instead, she's sent to live at an abbey in England. Marie doesn't want to go to this abbey. She is devastated that she's going to be sent away. It means that she's forced to leave her long-term companion, Cecily, who I would argue is actually her partner. But even though she has Cecily, Marie is in a very complicated way in love with the queen. So she doesn't want to leave her either. Marie is, let's just say, not receptive to the idea of becoming a nun, let alone taking on a position of leadership within this abbey. She's barely even religious when she arrives. So at first, she bucks the system. And in a fit of rebellion, she writes all of these poems, these lays, as they were called, that the real Marie of France was well known for. But after that early section where we get to see her composing these lays, there is very little discussion of Marie as a writer, at least in the way you would expect if this was truly an imagining of the life of the real Marie de France. I would say instead that Lauren Groff seems to have been inspired by the real Marie de France, but instead chose to focus this book on her life as first a prioress of this abbey and then later as its abbess. The publisher's synopsis of this book, the one that is printed on the book itself, says that this is a book about female creativity. I disagree. This book is so much more about female ambition. Like I mentioned before, when Marie arrives at the Abbey, she is not happy about it. She essentially calls it hell on earth. And that's not just a teenage flair for the dramatic. It is actually in really rough shape when she gets there. A lot of the nuns are sick. Some of them have died from illness. The ones who have survived are cold and hungry. The place is financially in very dire straits. It's all being mismanaged. So after Marie's brief fit of rebellion, where she writes all these lays because she thinks that means someone will come and get her, she'll be saved from this hell on earth, she realizes that she's going to be stuck there for the rest of her life. And if that's true, 
then she might as well use her skills and make the best of it. And that's precisely what she does. Even from a young age, Marie knew that she was an extraordinary person. And at first, when she arrives at the Abbey, she lets that depress her. Like this Abbey is so far beneath her. There's so much more she could do. Why is she being locked away like this? But when her mindset changes, everything changes for her. So instead of feeling like she's being brought down to the Abbey's level, she decides that she's going to bring the Abbey up to her level, the level that she thinks she's at anyway. And she uses her intelligence and her cunning to get this Abbey first back on solid ground, and then she makes it powerful and continues to grow its power. After Marie builds the Abbey's wealth, she also starts to grow it in physical size. So new buildings are added. She adds layers of protection to the outside to protect herself and the other nuns who live there. And a lot of these projects are taken on because of these divine visions that Marie talks about having throughout the book. She describes them within the book. And I think this is potentially a place where Marie may be deceiving us. I think an interesting question for you to keep in mind as you read this book, if you choose to read this book, is, did Marie ever really become pious? And then a follow-up question, depending on your answer, What are Marie's true motivations for elevating this Abbey to greatness? Even if I had clear answers to either of those questions, I wouldn't choose to share them in this video because I think that would mean spoiling elements of this book that are yours to discover if you choose to read it. But if you do choose to read it, I do think one thing is very clear. And that's the fact that Marie really cares about these women who live at the Abbey, the nuns. Even if she doesn't get along with all of them, and she doesn't, she wants what's best for them. But as their leader, that sometimes means making hard decisions. You could even argue sinful decisions in order to keep them safe, to keep them safe, to keep herself safe and to keep her power well protected. Like I said before, I think more than anything else, this book is a study of the power of female ambition. Marie's desire to leave indentations of her fingers on power is described as this hunger, and she actually gets better under pressure. And while she does have people in her life who will try to talk her out of the really crazy ideas that she has, Her leadership is very much an example of one party rule. (laughs) Marie is the queen bee and every other nun is merely a worker. And I'm not pulling that metaphor out of nowhere. There are actually a handful of them within the book comparing the abbey to a hive. So I don't think it's an accident that a physical characteristic of Marie's, the reason why Queen Eleanor said that she wouldn't be able to be married off and sent her to this abbey in the first place, is that Marie is very big. She's a very large woman. It's said that she's three heads taller than any woman should be. That's a quote from the book. And I don't know how up on natural history you are, but that's a characteristic of a queen bee. The queen bee is larger than the workers, which are the sexually underdeveloped female bees. Now, when we use the term queen bee and we're applying it to society, it normally has a negative connotation. It's normally attached to teenage girls. And it means that one person, normally a young woman, has all the power. All the other girls do what she says. They flock around her. They are her underlings. Think Mean Girls. Think Regina George. But what I think people forget about Queen Bees, or maybe they don't even know in the first place, is that while, yes, she's the biggest bee in the hive and everything revolves around her, this is also an insect that doesn't leave the hive after she's ready to reproduce unless there's a swarm and they all go together. Her job is to create offspring, to create the new generations of mainly female worker bees and also some drones, but mainly the female worker bees. And she does pretty much that and only that. So if you look at that side of it from a human perspective, she stops being the number one bee in charge and she becomes more of a prisoner. Marie is a queen bee then in every sense. Yeah, she's large and in charge. But also she's trapped in this abbey and she has no choice but to proliferate. The other nuns become her spiritual daughters. When she becomes abbess, they call her mother. There is a lot of imagery in this book that relates to motherhood and fertility, which is a really interesting aspect of a book that is set in an abbey, a place filled with women sworn to virginity. But even the title of this book relates back to that idea. Keanu Reeves might spring to mind when you hear the word major 
matrix, but it is actually Latin for mother. And it was a word used to describe pregnant female animals, or it could even just mean a womb. And I think it's the perfect title for this book, because I think in so many more ways than the publisher's synopsis does, it prepares you for what you're about to read. Because this book is distinctly feminine. And I'm not talking about the modern way, meaning delicate or covered in pink bows. I am talking about a powerful, white, hot female energy, the ability of a body to create new life, forging connections and cultivating influence when you're supposedly the weaker sex. This book doesn't show this collective of women succeeding in spite of their sex but because of it. I do need to note at this point though, just so that I'm not giving you the wrong impression, even though all of that and more is going on within this book, don't go into it looking for anything fast paced. This book is very careful, very considered. It's a book that largely hides its power, not unlike Marie herself. But this is why I think people are going to have a lot of mixed reactions to this book. But I think you'll find the glory in it if you have the patience to go along for the ride that it's actually looking to take you on versus what the publisher wants you to believe about it. If there is one major thing, though, that will pull you through this book despite the slow pace, it's Lauren Groff's writing. Her writing in this book is incredible. It's just as good as I remember in Fates and Furies. And I've actually evolved a lot as a reader of fiction since 2015. So it was so nice to be able to revisit her writing and remind myself what I loved about it. But now I feel much more capable of putting into words what I love about it. Because she doesn't get overly wordy. I didn't find in this book anyway. She instead uses very precise, very potent word choices to bring this world to life in as few words as possible. And the research for this book seems to have been impeccable. I don't know a whole lot about the Middle Ages. I've never been overly interested in the Middle Ages, but I felt like I was there when I was reading this book and it made me more interested in the Middle Ages. I don't often talk about the format in which I recommend you read a book only on very special occasions, but if you want to read this book, I highly recommend you read the ebook. That way, when there's the occasional Middle Ages term that pops up, you can highlight it and look it up. I would have missed a lot of the references if I hadn't read this on ebook. I really enjoyed Matrix overall, but I don't think it was the perfect book. I do think it overstayed its welcome a little bit, which is an odd thing to think about a book that doesn't even break 300 pages, but I feel it all the same. I think the build up to the ending was rather weak. Some overly convenient things happened. And generally, I felt like there were aspects of Marie's character that were left unexplored at the end of the book. Those things were disappointing. But overall, I do think Lauren Groff has another winner on her hands. The writing is spectacular. The book is luminous and emotionally raw. I absolutely devoured it. And I think if you loved Fates and Furies as much as I did, there is every possibility you will love this one too. But those are my thoughts on Lauren Groff's latest novel, Matrix. If you have any comments or questions about anything you've seen in this video or about anything in general, please feel free to leave those in the comment section below. If you really liked this book, be sure to check out the further reading section part of my description box, where I will recommend you some books you might be interested in that I think are similar to this one. And after you're done checking that out, be sure to go to the bottom of the description box where you can find links to everywhere you can find me across social media, including Goodreads and Instagram, if you'd like to keep up with what I'm reading and writing about right now. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I will see you in the next video. Bye.